Good morning. Good morning. We're uh, we're into the second phase of uh, spacecraft uh, capstones now. So we've got uh, two presentations uh, uh, from spacecraft detail. The first one is uh, uh, from a team of team. Uh, L, yeah, launch launch sample return to LSR Aerospace. And uh, I'll turn it over to Allison Reed for that. We've got uh, uh, four panelists up here. I'll just have you guys introduce yourselves when it comes time for the Q&A. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Allison Reed, and I am the team lead for LSR Aerospace. So this briefing will go over our project with a little bit of design and through fabrication and focusing on our testing. Now I'd like to introduce my team, starting with Walter Murray, <coughs> Serafino Marvitavos, AJ Marine, Blake Colson, Matthew Taylor, Aureli Silva, Juan Gutierrez, Marty Argestein, Joe Christensen, Jonathan Kozik, Jonathan Haber, and Petrara Singh Pitzer Pan. So this is a brief overview picture of our project, and I'll have Joe show you a little close-up of our actual working lander. So throughout the briefing, uh, we're going to go in detail through every subsystem, and then finally the end results of our project. And now I'd like to hand it off to Walter Gowdy, who will explain objectives. Thank you, Allison. So back in the very beginning of prelim, we set out with the goal of designing a sample return mission to Mars. Now obviously if we had the funding, we would love to do that, but we don't. So we had to scale it down to this lander, keeping in theme with the concept. This was going to be the prototype of the lander for our mission. During prelim, we designed, we uh, split design into threshold and objective requirements, and this semester during detail, we focused our design on those objective requirements. Our primary objectives were to construct a functional lander to successfully integrate all of our systems. It would have a working controller and propulsion system, as well as correct its orientation and land independently. We also want to demonstrate the feasibility of our lander concept by testing our subsystems for each, for each of the requirements, then testing the system as a whole. Our secondary objectives were to provide our team with valuable experience that will help us later on during industry and during our careers. So now I'll move into our concept of operations. First, we need to conduct our subsystem tests to verify whether or not our subsystems met each requirement. And then after we've completed those tests, we integrated the system as a whole. For our full lander test, we constructed a test apparatus, and this test apparatus would safely control the descent of our lander during testing with the, uh, with the uh, final goal of doing an unassisted drop. We dropped the testing apparatus and verified its capability to land in correct its orientation. So here's what the drop would look like theoretically. We have a bit of a graphic. We start with an app audit. We start hanging from an off attitude. As you can see here, our ACS system, the default is thrusters on. We can get into and we can get into that a little bit later in question and answer. As it drops, it would shut off a thruster to correct its orientation. Once it is in the proper landing formation, it would fire its thruster to slow down. And once it got close enough to the ground, our distance sensors would tell the thruster to turn off and the system would land safely. Now here is a video of our actual drop. One second, there doesn't seem to be any sound. Good. Okay, it looks like we're having a bit of technical difficulties with the sound, but during the testing, you can hear the solenoids turning on and off with our main actuator, and we can have a live demonstration because we still have a bit of a fuel. So, this is a little loud, so just be warned. So this is the main thruster on our lander. Which was not as loud as it was during testing. All right. <laughs> so moving on to our mass budget, as you can see, each of our subsystems was well under its allocated mass, except for the propulsion system, because we had some additional parts that we did not account for initially when we made these designs and our system as a whole was just slightly over our goal of 10 kilograms. Our monetary budget, again, propulsion was over budget because of those extra parts, but the other subsystems were under budget enough that we still came out with a balance of $357 remaining to our project. Now I'd like to hand it over to Serafina Borfadavos to talk about controls and sensors. Thank you, Walter. I'm 
Serafino Borgonados. I am the Controls and Sensors Subsystem Team Lead, and we'll be going over Controls and Sensors. What the Controls and Sensors Subsystem is responsible for is evaluating the environment and responding to it accordingly. That means turning on and off the main thruster at appropriate times during flight, as well as all of the attitude control thrusters to correct its orientation when it's falling. Now it consists of a Beagle Black microcontroller, an add a fruit inertial measurement unit, as well as two sharp range sensors, one being a long range and one being a short medium range. For our requirements, we absolutely needed the ability to store data externally. That meant if something were to happen, we would be able to retrieve the data card and view the data, see what went wrong, that way we could correct for it in the future. We had to be compatible with all of our components. That means that we're able to work with each one, receive data, send data, those types of things that we would actually have a functioning system. And we also needed to have position sense. And this included attitude determination as an objective requirement, but to meet our threshold requirement of actuating a main thruster or indication of actuation of a main thruster, we absolutely had to have distance sensing capability. So we knew exactly when to fire that main thruster. We need to be able to identify that all the components had the correct capabilities that we needed, that the range sensors would actually indeed sense the ranges that we expected them to. They had to be compatible with our microcontroller. It isn't an Arduino, it's something that's a little bit harder to interface with, so we need to make sure we can actually do that. As well as that distance sensing capability, as I mentioned before, that was a critical requirement that we absolutely needed. On the left of the screen, you can see the Beagle Bone Black with the IMU on the left hand side and the XP for sending data wirelessly, which was an objective requirement as well. And those two yellow wires you can see on there are actually parts of connecting resistors, so that way we could scale down the output of our range sensors to a value that the people on black actually read down front of the board. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see the data output of a terminal connected to the people on black. And essentially, what we're doing is verifying the size of that SD card. So we ended up having 31.154 gigabytes, which is way overkill for a short test. In fact, it's actually large enough to provide continuous data for 23 days. So you could be dropping the thing for 23 days and capture every second of data. It was very cheap, that's why we went with this option, so the overkill was acceptable. <laughs> Here you can see the Beagle One Black as well as on the lander itself. The S wire is essentially for all the solenoids as well as for a few other things, including some power. That goes off to a power actuator board that uses essentially solid state relays to actuate the solenoids. As well as on the two bundle of wires up top, you can see that the, those actually connect to the analog input of the beagle bone, as well as those go to the range sensors, which are an analog output. The beagle bone black is powered through five volts provided through our power supply through a barrel jack connector. On the left, you can see the long-range distance sensor calibration curve, as well as on the right, the short-range sensor. We need to be able to quantify in some way what our accuracy of those sensors were. We ended up getting an accuracy of about 20 centimeters for the long-range sensor, and that's because their range is from 100 centimeters all the way out to 500 centimeters, and there can be a lot of noise in terms of ambient light. So they work by picking up infrared light reflected back. If there's anything around, they'll get interference from that, so 20 centimeters. With the short range distance sensor, we got closer to two centimeters. So these were much more accurate as well as less susceptible to noise. One thing that we ended up finding out after we had gotten the components is we actually did not need to take into account the attitude of the lander to get the total drop height. This is because the proximity sensors actually send out a spotlight, essentially like a flashlight. So if it's tilted sideways, the sensor is going to pick up the center of that spot as the averaged area. So it essentially finds the centroid of it just in the design of it itself. So that way, if you're at an off attitude, you're still going to get that line that's perpendicular coming back to the lander. So that was handy in terms of we didn't need to use any attitude information to determine how high we actually were off the ground. Fortunately, we were able to meet all of our design requirements, both threshold and objective, coming in at a cost of $123, as well as a mass well under budget and that oversized SD card, as I mentioned before. We had compatibility with all our components, which was great. We didn't have too many issues actually connecting to them with their whatever protocols that they use specifically. And the distance detection was actually ended up being better than we thought in terms of we did not need to use our attitude information. 
Here you can see how everything's actually connected up to the view below. If you have any questions specifically about how things are connected, please save those for the question and answer session as we are very limited on time. This is the actual power actuator board that connects to GPIO pins on the Beagle Bone Black, and the XB is also connected through two UART pins. The Beagle Bone Black itself is bolted down onto the top plate of the lander, which is an aluminum plate. And most things are just connected through wires that are hooked up to the XB shield. So the XB shield is really the interface between the controller and actually controlling things on the board. And I'll pass it off to AJ with communications. Thank you, Serafino. Eric, so as mentioned, I'm AJ Buddy, and I'm the subsystem team lead for the communication subsystem. So for our subsystem, our main task is for data storage and data app allocation. So for um, two means that we're going to be employing is an onboard storage method using a micro SD card and then a, a wireless transmission through RF to a ground station computer using XB's radios. So what our subsystem consists of was two XB radios with two external antennas, a micro SD card, which would be inserted into the Beagle Bump Black onboard system, as well as the, the shield that interfaced the XP to the Beagle Bone, as well as acted as a prototyping board, and finally, a micro SD card. So for our critical requirements, we needed to store 25 megabytes of data. This was calculated in the beginning of the semester to be the data space size that we needed for all the sens sensitive peripherals that you're going to be taking measurements with for a 10 minute in duration drop test. And so, as well as we needed to transmit this data simultaneously up to a ground station where we could have a backup means for data storage. So for a, our performance metrics, we needed to be able to analyze the, the data space size uh, and we, for the functionality, we need to make sure that we're, we actually have a proper transmission communication between uh, radios. So moving into our performance metric, we deployed three tests. One was the pre-flight analysis test. This is when we, uh, a test when we turn on all the sensory peripherals to include the IMU and um, proximity sensors. And we would let this run for 10 minutes in duration um, at the end of it, which we would then analyze the data space size to see if we have um, enough space as well as the consistency between the data that we're seeing in the observation as well as on the card itself. For the data transmission test, we wanted to see if we had a proper communication between the two XBs. Uh, so this is looking at the success rate of the, the packets that we're sending to the packets that we're receiving at the ground station. And then uh, in conjunction to this, we wanted to employ a range test where we would be looking at the, the signal of power that we're receiving and to see if this was above the minimum threshold. So moving into it, our pre-flight analysis test uh, consists of uh, a comparison between terminals from Linux or the BeagleBone Black. We compared uh, the actual data text file of what we we're outputting it to, uh, specifically instantaneous row and pitch values, which we're outputting to the main terminal display. And we were able to compare the two um, to find a consistency of 100%. And we actually discovered that we achieved a uh, a data space size of 9.28 megabytes, well below our 25 megabytes prediction. Um, so what this means is that we have a lot more storage allocation that we could get with uh, just a single drop test. So moving into the data transmission test, uh, as you can see on the right, there's a series of frames where we um, employed a, uh, a data transmission test looking at the success rate. What we found out was that there was a immediate drop off around one meter. This was not predicted as these XPs are expected to function well over to 20 to 30 meters with a uh, success rate of 90 and above. So it was then discovered that this was appearing again in range tests as well uh, at this one meter um, Brussel that we're finding a unique drop off. And what we discovered was that there was an issue with the actual antennas that we were using uh, that happened during fabrication while soldering the antennas to the XPs radios. And so what that initially did was that it dropped our signal to noise ratio. And so we weren't actually using the antennas um, 
to the, their full capabilities. Exactly. So for our design metrics, we are able to meet all our requirements to include our data space size, cost, and NAS um, requirements, but sadly we're not able to complete functionality design metrics due to the, uh, the issues we had with the XB fabrication. So for our integration for our subsystem into the main um, lander, we have the shield as mentioned by Serafino that would be used as a prototyping board between the, the many um, controller outputs with the controller as well as with the XB and uh, the Picobo flap would connect to the micro SD card via a card slot. It, and at the ground station side, we would have an XB connected to a ground station computer through a Explorer USB where we could upload the data and then save it on the, a desktop or a laptop and then use it for later data analysis. For the developmental tools that we use, um, include Linux, XCTU, which is a digi software for the XB specifically, Excel and MATLAB. So without further ado, I'd like to call up Blake Olson to discuss Power Bi. Thank you, Agent. So getting right into it, the power subsystem is there to provide energy to the entire system, the solenoids, our microcontroller, and the sensors. Not only that, but we have to provide it at regulated levels. Without these regulated levels, it is very possible that our controllers will not function properly. So it's made up, as you can see, an electrical source, which is a battery, two lithium ion polymer battery put in series, as well as a voltage regulation circuit, and lastly, the actuator switch, which is used to turn it on and off our solenoids. Our critical requirements, number one, we have to have enough energy to uh, test twice in a row. That was the big one, and from there we moved into needing to provide enough current from our batteries, because that primary solenoid likes to draw about two and a half amps, and it's on all the time. So, <clears throat> from there, again, seeing that voltage, we have to provide the right voltage for our components to work properly. So this leads us into our design metrics. Our energy capacity, current handling capability of the batteries, and then the output voltage rails, what we're going to see there. Moving into the energy capacity test, again, we have two lithium ion polymer batteries rated at 1,000 milliamp hours. They are two cell batteries. Putting them in series gives us a nominal voltage of 14.8 volts, with a maximum voltage of about 16.4 volts. Using the nominal voltage, we have calculated um, energy capacity of 14.8 watt hours, tested it with a pass rate of 90% or more, needing that for it to pass. We ended up with 14.15 watt hours, which was more than enough. <clears throat> for the current handling design metric, you can see in this table, that the discharge rate of the batteries is 20 times its capacity, giving us a discharge ability of 20 amps. We tested it at 5 amps because that's a little more than what we needed when all our components were on. The test was designed to take the course of 10 minutes, which was the length of the test. For the voltage rails, um, we'll go real quick over the design here. We have the 5 volt regulator and then the 212 volt regulators. You'll notice that the 212 volt regulators are through hole. This is done so that we have allowable space for heat sinks due to the large current draw on these channels. When testing them, again, we have the 5 volt and 12 volt rails. We saw an average voltage of 4.98 volts on the 5 volt channel, and then 11.96 and 11.95 volts on the 12 volt channels. Let it be noted that maximum and minimum values were not recorded because there was no more deviation than about 30 millivolts throughout the course of the one hour test for this uh, instance. Going over a summary, we did meet all of our requirements for this subsystem. I'd also like to note that not on here, uh, we did consider a redundancy of the power system, and it was feasible. However, we did not end up doing it due to the allowable space on our top plate and the scope of the project. But as you can see, uh, again, the information from our primary tests, the mass of our source being much less than what we needed, as well as the regulator and um, actuator switch, we came in at a cost of about $30, well under the 100 that we had planned. As far as integration is concerned, connected to the uh, voltage regulator is the source of the batteries. From there, the regulator connects to the distance sensors and beagle bone directly, powering them with 5 volts each. And then finally, the 12 volt channels are hooked into the actuator switch port, which the solenoids are then hooked into, as well as a signal wire coming from the beagle bone. 
Next, I'd like to call Matthew Taylor to talk about propulsion. Thank you, Blake. Okay, like Blake said, I'm Matthew Taylor, and we'll be covering the propulsion system today. So, as a quick subsystem description, um, I'm cut some things out. Thank you. So, overall, our job is to provide a thrust for the system. As you can see, called out on the slide and in front of you with the actual lander are some of our key components, the main compressed air tanks, along with our ACS actuators on top, our main actuator that's in the middle between both tanks, below that's the main nozzle, and then lastly we have a release valve to arm and save the system when necessary. <clears throat> So for our critical design requirements, <laughs> um, we had to have the capability of controlling all of our actuators and directing the flow as needed throughout our system, of course. We also needed to have an adequate fuel supply for our test and to minimize the subsystem mass because, of course, every kilogram we add to our lander is another kilogram we now have to slow down. We also needed to make sure that our pressurized fluid, working fluid system was controllable and that we were able to provide the sufficient thrust for our ACS and our main engine. So, for our design requirements, you can see them called out here on this table with their description here, the physical requirement there, and to the right of that, what our analysis predicted those values to be. We'll come back to this table at the end. So for our critical performance metrics, we needed to first be able to indicate control of our, each of one of our actuators and make sure that we could control those. We also needed to have a wet versus dry mass metric in which we were going to measure the tanks, empty, then pull, and take that net for our fuel capacity. Again, we needed to ver verify that our pressurization was good and that we didn't have any leaks both up and downstream of our release valve. And lastly, we of course needed to have sufficient thrust for both again our ACS and our main engine. So moving into the test for each one of those, for our ACS actuators and our main solenoid, what we did is we hooked them up to a power supply, slowly brought up the voltage until we heard the audible click for each solenoid firing. This was then noted in the table for that voltage, and we had to make sure that all of those voltages were able to meet our requirements. For our wet versus dry mass test, pretty straightforward, pretty cut and dry. Tanks were empty, we measured them, took that weight, or mass, excuse me, filled the tanks up, then took that mass, took the difference as our fuel capacity, and our total mass for the overall subsystem mass of our system. For the pressurization test, we then took those filled tanks, put them into the system, and made sure we had no leaks upstream of the release valve, open the release valve, let the flow go out, make sure we had no leaks downstream, and that all of our flow was directed in the appropriate amounts to the appropriate thrusters to achieve our um, requirement. Lastly, for our thruster test, we were gonna take the lander, hook it up to a load cell, open up the um, release valve, and let the flow out and measure that thrust from the load cell. And we had some issues with each of these tests, which we'll get into now. So initially, for our analysis of our <coughs> Controlled indicators. We went with our hardware specifications to determine which voltage we would need for these. Then we then tested this with the power supply, which I talked about, and we found that this worked very well, and we we're actually coming in much under the voltages we had anticipated for each solenoid. The one exception, which Blake had brought up previously with the power, is that our main solenoid had a we misinterpreted the offset value. So instead of being closed to start and provide power to open it, it was the opposite. So we had to constantly provide a power just to keep it closed and firing our system inadvertently in the beginning. So which placed an, un, um, an unanticipated extra requirement upon the power system. As for our wet versus dry mass test, again, this was very straightforward. We took the difference of the tanks and then found that to be our fuel capacity. We found that we were a little bit under on our total fuel capacity, and this was mostly due to the fact that we had some residual air from local atmosphere in the tanks. We couldn't get them all the way down the vacuum. And that our gauges are not perfectly calibrated. In fact, there's about a 200 PSI difference between each tanks when they are at a full 4,500 4, PSI. So moving on to our verification and pressurization, this one went very well, and after several yards of Teflon, we had to make sure that we had no leaks within our lander. Also that we had, um, uh, that our flow was being directed in appropriate amounts, and that our um, constricted areas were working appropriately so that we weren't blowing open our ACS actuators inadvertently during the test. Lastly, for our thrust test, this one was by far the trickiest and gave us the most issues to work through. This was mostly due to the fact that we didn't actually have a really ideal sensor for measuring at the load cell. And in fact, we uh, ended up not using a load cell because we landed right in those, one of those ranges where all the load cells we could use were either too small and we're gonna overload them simply by placing a lander on them, or they were too big and we were losing all of our data to noise, which is what ended up happening. 
So we switched to a fish scale and had to have a um, analog reading of an individual just pulling that value off when the thruster was open. It wasn't as accurate as we would have uh, would have liked and didn't get an overall good time sampling for that, but it did give us some valid numbers to work with. And as it turns out, we came in a little bit under for our overall thrust. Again, here's that table that I talked about in, that in the beginning. As you can see, um, the description requirements and analysis are to the left, and our overall test values and whether or not we met our requirements to the right. We did very well on, again, our solenoids for the voltage required to open them. Again, the mask, we did have some issues. We went a little bit over. It was just mostly attributed to the fact that we had a few piece parts we didn't account for, and they added up a little faster than we anticipated. So we went a little bit over there. And again, I talked about already how we had a little bit of residual air in the tanks and then not improperly calibrated gauges, which led to an insufficient uh, fuel capacity. For our thrust, excuse me, so for our pressure ratings and release valves, we did meet those requirements. And lastly, with our thrust, we came a little bit under than we would have liked. So for overall integration, as you can see, we needed required power to help us hold open our um, actuators and actually control our thrust. We also needed structures to mount all of our um, subsystem and to provide proper support so they would not be damaged. Lastly, controls and sensors helped us out by giving us sensor data to let us know when we need to turn it off and then telling us when to turn it on. Now I'd like to bring up Aureli Silva and she's going to discuss structures. Thank you, Matthew. Like you said, I'm Aureli Silva and I'll be going over the structure subsystem. In an overview, our preliminary designs concluded through our trace studies that aluminum 6061 T6 would be the best material for our frame and our legs. For the foot pads, we decided that we would go with the low density polyethylene foam. We were supposed to support a mass of at least 10 kilograms and also withstand an impact loading without any failure to the structure as well as the components on board. Through our first stages of analysis, we concluded that the lander would experience around 70 Gs of mass inertial loading. This, this gave us the capability of finding out that the critically loaded member would be the diagonal beam underneath both of the propulsion tanks. Through ANSYS analysis, we simulated that same beam and applied the appropriate constraints and loading to this beam on ANSYS. We found out that the maximum stress experience on this beam would still be less than the yield strain capability of the material with adding the 1.5 factor of safety. We cross-referenced our hand calculations and found a 3.4% error with, with that max stress. We felt comfortable with this, with this analysis to continue on with this material for our structure. Once we received the material, we fabricated a test specimen and performed a three-point bend test with that same aluminum 6061 T6. This graph here shows the force applied by the load frame versus its displacement measured by the load frame. The orange line denotes the linear region representing the elastic deformation of the beam during this test. At the top of this line is when plastic deformation begins to happen to the specimen and therefore is a type of failure. We concluded that this, this would happen around 489 megapascals, therefore confirming that our material was strong enough to withstand not only our requirement but even more loadings. And therefore, we decided to weld the entire structure as you see before you and we, become, and we perform a structure drop test at 0.38 meters. We placed accelerometers onto the structure to um, calculate the experienced loading to see if it was comparable to our ex expected 70 Gs of loading. Our three areas of interest were adhesive strength, structure strength, and impact absorbance. The tabulated data you see before you um, confirms that there is no failure to any of the three interest areas and the calculated, ex calculated um, experience loading was 68 Gs, which is extremely close to the predicted value of 70 Gs. Therefore, in summary, we met all of our requirements to support a mass of at least 10 kilograms, and it's also support an impact loading without any structural failure to the system, as well as the components on board. We're also under budget and under mass in our um, mass and cost metrics. As far as integration goes, as mentioned before in this presentation, the controls, power, and communications are all bolted to the top plate, as you see there. The propulsion tanks were secured by foam and hose clamps, and the main nozzle was screwed onto the diagonal beam, and the AC thrusters and the sensors were also epoxied onto the frame. 
We use zip ties and electrical tape for the wiring and other components for our fabrication. I would like to bring up Sergio Brocadavos to go over system test. Thank you, Ron. For our mass metric, as we previously mentioned, we were a little bit over that. In total, we could not exceed 10 kilograms of mass. Unfortunately, we were at 10.05 kilograms of mass due to the propulsion system. The other subsystems were not under mass enough to compensate for that fact. However, all the other subsystems were under budget. We predicted a value of 9.16 kilograms. Just things get left out. You miss zip ties, you miss electrical tape. All those things add up. For our drop test, we really wanted to be able to reuse the lander as long as possible, so we didn't want any visible damage whatsoever on the lander itself, so we could keep reusing all of the substances. We needed that indication of a propulsion system being activated. Whether or not that was going to be an LED or the actual propulsion system was later determined to actually be the propulsion system due to how all of the tests were going and the fact that we were able to get it working. Now, we need also to be able to record all of the relevant data from the sensors. This included range sensor data as well as the attitude information provided from the inertial measurement. And we wanted to be able to transmit the data. As AJ mentioned before, we had issues with the XB's antennas. On prior testing, we were able to do that at a very short range. So we did end up being able to do that, however, not for the actual test. The actual test, the Beagle One Black actually has an Ethernet port on it. So we were able to connect a very long Ethernet cable to it so we can get that live data feeding back to a computer still for all the telemetry. We also wanted really badly to have a propulsive landing untethered to be able to not have any sort of system on it to slow it down other than the propulsion system itself. Here's the actual drop. So you can actually see we have two bungees, three bungees, correction, here, here, and here. So this main bungee takes the majority of the force, so the force is very strong with this one. And you can see <laughs> we really needed to create something to keep the lander from, from hitting the ground at a high velocity. It's a trap, essentially, for the lander itself. So what we, we ended up doing was we still used that propulsion system as our indication. The sound was working, you'd actually hear the main solenoid turn that airflow way down once it gets down to the ground, it actually shuts off the air. So this was the telemetry that we were getting back to a computer connected through that ethernet cable. You can see that the short distance was 52 centimeters here, that's coming from the short range sensor as we were within its range. You can actually see in this telemetry as well, after this lander has gone down to the ground, it actually bounces back up. So you can see that range here, getting larger again, and then bouncing just a little bit. <coughs> so you can, it makes the correct propulsion system decisions. It fires the main thruster above this 50 centimeters, which is the cutoff distance for the main thruster, which is why it is coming back on as it is up high again, because of the bouncing. Now, our roll value was out of our tolerance. It was 11.156 degrees, as calculated by the MMU. So we also are making a correct attitude decision in turning off the thruster full of power. So what that does is because we have that default on position, what the controller is doing is it's turning one of those attitude control thrusters off to make the corrected roll of maneuver. The pitch is within tolerance. Our tolerance for an arbitrary value until we could calibrate it was seven and a half degrees. Through testing, this was going to be narrowed down. That way we could come up with a value that gave us our optimum performance of attitude control. Now, as you can see, we were not able to make two of our requirements of having a propulsive landing and real-time data acquisition, at least wirelessly, because the XP did not work. Now, we did have flight data from this being stored to the SD card. We were able to see all of our pitch and roll as well as our distances coming from the lander. And through the live telemetry, we were able to see actually which decisions were being made by the controller. And unfortunately, for the landing damage assessment, we did not actually conduct a full landing. The lander never hit the ground, so we were not able to see whether or not we would make that requirement. We did have the indication of propulsion. Hopefully we'll get that video working for you and questions answers. So you can actually hear that main solenoid turning on and off the air, as well as the attitude control thrusters firing. Now I'll pass it off to Juan Gutierrez with the configuration of the Thank you, sir. Okay, so the question comes, how do you organize our systems? So here you can see an overall structure tree for all of our subsystems and main system. 
whereas 0, 06s and 366 represent the main assembly and the main bill of materials. So each one of these subsystems has the bill of bill materials associated in the assembly drawings. So controller, uh, actuator control switch, voltage regular circuit, propulsion, and all within propulsion, the subassemblies that it contains. Uh, structure, of course. Here's an example of the main thruster subassembly where you can see all the components are organized with a ID number and are organized in such a way that you can see how it is constructed and assembled. Here's the example for the uh, uh, bill of materials for that uh, main thruster subassembly. And you can see uh, that the components are labeled for a n and numbered and how many components of each are used. So if a labor, pro a labor team or someone picks up our project, and is dismantled, it can be constructed again and therefore in an accurate way, the way we did it. So how, do, how this ID number comes in? So our three first numbers represent the category in which we organize our parts and uh, for, uh, assembly files, bill of materials, and so forth. Now how do we organize our components? So this comes in an instance. So this is basically the ID number within that, within that category. This category uh, can be, for example, uh, subassembly for propulsion, uh, the bill of materials, and so forth. And so now the flavor comes in when we have two of the same parts with minute differences. These minute differences are accounting uh, within the flavor. And I'll pass it on to Alice for me. Thank you, Juan. So in conclusion, I'd like to just go over the monetary budget once more. Um, as you can see, all of our subsystems are under budget except for propulsion. However, because of how much under budget all the subsystems were, it compensated for propulsion. So in the end, our cost is still meets our requirement except for that single subsystem. And we came out with a uh, very positive balance. So it's been a long year, and last semester focused mainly on preliminary design, figuring out what mission and what route we wanted to take for our detailed project. Now this semester, it began with component design and going through and ordering all our parts, fabrication, and finally testing, and, and concluding with this briefing. So we've learned a lot of lessons in a year. Uh, the first and most important is probably standardization. And having 13 people contributing to one document or one project is quite a feat, and it transfers over into industry when you have 50 or hundreds of people working towards one goal. And also, priorities come into play when you have multiple things to do at the same time, and you want to make sure they all get done at the best quality. And because we had five subsystems that were quite complicated in their own right, they required a large amount of communication in order to work together and make sure that they all knew what each other was doing. And so we used OneDrive for our centralized online database. And an online database for everybody to access is amazing in theory. However, one, the OneDrive server tended to go down at the most inconvenient times, leaving us to be late on certain assignments. So in the future, I would suggest people find a different database, paid for or not. Again, part ordering was something that we uh, had to deal with. Some of our parts were not shipped on time, ordered on time, and caused great delays in our fabrication process. And our only regret is that we didn't have more time to spend on fabricating and testing our project to the fullest extent. And lastly, companies didn't always provide reliable information whether it was regarding the specifications on their components that were missing or incorrect, or the services that a certain company would provide that were also incorrect. However, we have overcome all of these uh, obstacles and ended up meeting a large majority <coughs> of our requirements and all of our threshold requirements. I'd like to take the time to thank all of the faculty and staff that helped our project Without their support, uh, it would not have come to fruition. And I'd especially like to thank Dr. Yale, Professor Mangum, and Jim Weber for helping us so much throughout this long year. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Tom Kay at Shoebox Professors. 
uh, shoe wax compressors, excuse me. Our tanks require an extremely high PSI, and this was the only uh, compressor that would reach that pressure. And he donated this compressor to the school. I'd also like to thank Andrew Clark at Performance Powder Coating, who went out of his way to especially fabricate our main nozzle. And that concludes our briefing, so I'd like to open the floor up to questions. Jacob Alder. I'm an alumni from uh, this campus. Uh, we currently work as an aerospace engineer doing data analysis. Uh, I want to start off, start off by saying great job. I remember when I was reviewing this last semester during the program, this was mentioned that this was a very ambitious undertaking. And, uh, well, I've done a very good job. Uh, my main, I have mainly two questions. Um, the first one, this one is pressing uh, in the back of my mind a little bit more, is uh, in terms of general safety. Uh, the pressure vessels that you're using, what are those made out of? So the pressure vessel, the pressure vessels we have are from paintball tanks and they're made of carbon fiber. They have a five-year warranty, so that's five years of continuous use before they break, and we didn't have any issues with them uh, as far as pressure. Okay, my question then moves on to, I think it was the structure <coughs> subsystem, where they said one of their metrics was there was no visual damage. So there's one thing to keep in mind with composite materials is they do not always exhibit external damage, especially on the back. Um, what I'm seeing here is you have two composite pressure vessels that are pressed directly against metal and experiencing a 70 G load. Uh, it just makes me a little nervous that you're assuming there wasn't necessarily any internal damage that could have weakened those structures. It's just something to keep in mind in the future. Okay. Trust me, I've seen enough pressure vessels go because of that kind of issue. Uh, the next question I have uh, is more for the propulsion team. Um, you mentioned a lot about the, the attitude control thrusters and the tests of all that. Was there a, a deceleration test conducted on the main uh, descent thruster? Or, uh, or what, what exactly happened? Because in the, the tests we see in these videos, it looks like it's hit, you know, reaching the bungee cord limit at full uh, terminal velocity. Right, so um, if you remember from the table that had our thrust values, we normally moved to achieve about, about 29 newtons, where our lander weighs uh, right around 100 newtons. So unfortunately, that difference in thrust is not a lot to really show in a video that over a long period of time, it's, it's more or less achieving its full terminal velocity for that short distance. Um, we did have it firing, and again, we were hoping we could get the sound. Did we get the sound working? So you should yeah. be able to hear in this video the thruster on, and it's very loud and obnoxious, and then it will close it. So we were firing. It didn't have as much an effect in terms of thrust that we would have liked, but it was. It did work, and we were able to pull some data from the IMU with that. Okay, uh, I, I think it was just the. The differences between the thrust and the actual weight, I think I made this second one. Thank you. Congratulations, guys. You guys are pretty much almost graduating. <coughs> so I'll make this short and sweet because probably I just plugged out of here. Um, for your mass up, did you take factor safety into consideration at all? For mass budget, I think slide 17. For all of our calculations in preliminary design, we did apply a factor of safety, especially anything uh, concerning the propulsion system and any safety critical items. So we were able to do the communication test with the actual lander. We did it inside ASVAP with the, um, the concrete walls did play an effect to that. Uh, but if we were to have more time as well as functioning at we would have uh, performed a proper system test with them. Okay. And then for 
for things, structures. Good job of our fellow pictures, Riley. Good job. Um, did you do any um, analysis on like when the welding was applied? Because you have a lot of like, structure analysis. I think the one picture you have is just the beam on the bottom. How much analysis did you do with the entire structure? It wasn't shown in the presentation on any of the slides, but we did do a ANSYS model and, and calculations of the entire structure. And in those um, calculations and in the model, it was assumed that it was all welded. And it actually gave us lower loads than with the, or lower stress experienced than with the critical member by itself. Okay, thank you. And I think that's pretty much all I have. So thank you. Good job. My name is Scott Wu, and I'm a retired Air Force, been involved in nuclear satellite system for 55 years. So I uh, want to say that I think you guys did a great job. The presentation was made very professional, and all were spectacular, and the class was very kind. Um, and the presentations were very clear and concise. It was a good job in the presentation overall. Thank you. So uh, it was discovered towards the end uh, with all the, uh, the transmission tests and the, the range tests that with the antennas, uh, we're seeing this drop off at one meter. Uh, and then so uh, just asking with professors and looking at the actual antennas, it was discovered that there was a problem on the XB. I tried to fix it, but in doing so, inadvertently damaged the chip antennas on them which after that point would not function well over three feet. So essentially have like a cold solder joint or something like yes. that. Yes. Try to re-solder if you got it too hot. Exactly. So and uh, the, uh, the second one was with a thrust. And when you did your you did, I saw you did kind of thrust testing. Um, didn't you know at the time that the thrust was too low when you did the thrust testing or was the test not uh, um, again, we, we did recognize um, a little bit too late that we have we did come under thrust, and we know that with almost certainty that our main problem is our mass flow rate. Essentially, the paintball tanks are not letting air out fast enough to go through the rest of the system. The pressure is good, but the mass flow rate is too low, and we could tell this right away because our test was lasting about an order of magnitude longer than it should have. So we knew it was just coming out way too slow. And we had some ideas that we were thinking about trying within the last week or two to fix that, but we didn't want to have, um, we didn't have time, and we didn't want to permanently damage the tanks and ruin other people's ability to use these tanks in the future, or completely discard them, or because we permanently modified them, just so we could prove or not that this was our problem. Okay, so. um, I'm going to ask you guys to do one good thing about the system test is didn't damage anything. So, no, we did not. So that was good. So we survived that. Um, the budget, you talked a little bit about the budget. You noted the one area where you went over budget. Um, the one thing that you guys cared about when you go over budget in your subsystems is the bottom number that counts. I can tell you the customer could care less when you go over in, in the internal areas as long as you maintain your, the budget that you told the customer to do the project for. So that was great. Thank you. Um, and the lessons learned, uh, I can probably tell you every one of those lessons learned, you'll see again. <laughs> <laughs> so just overall, really good job, guys. Really good. Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Anderson. I'm a recent member graduate as well. And I was on the Mars Lander team last semester. Personally, I think six per other people work better on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> that was <laughs> <hard problem. laughs> um, Okay, first, uh, let's go to AJ, bringing up the uh, 
XP again. Once you realize the XP is broken, was there no other options to maybe replace the XP? Because I know Canvas, we had to do all of it. Right. At the time, uh, I did speak with um, Danny and as well as go into the EE uh, SDL, but there were sadly no more XPs available due okay. to all the uh, projects on campus needing them. Uh, the, the space grant was one of them. Uh, and then at the time, it was over the weekend, the weekend before Thanksgiving, so it was like everyone was already out and we needed to perform the system drop test as soon as possible. So even if I were to order brand new XPs, they would not be here in time. So that makes sense. And I still see that the XP is still on the yeah. itself. Yes. You uh, are over by. 0.05 We could have, but uh, if we review, if we go back and review the individual uh, weight, I do not believe it weighs a significant amount. Okay, I was just wondering if you maybe pull a little bit to the top. <laughs> <laughs> if I can remember correctly, because our hand calculations didn't, didn't consider the hole in the middle. So we just did a oversimplification of the entire um, system and what would be happening, and it and kind of uh, calculated the max stress that would be happening with that. Okay. The same with the three-point bed test. We could, we, if we were to like try to make a hole into the beam, that would have changed all, all our values for the three-point bed test as well, and it would put us, in, put us into delay for fabrication as well. sensors could sense the perpendicular distance and due to our max range on the distance sensors we had that maximum angle that we could achieve to achieve that overall distance of the sensor. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. On the uh, actual test itself did you have it angled? Or? No because we did not actually have the capability to correct attitude due to insufficient thrust of that. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay there's uh, about five minutes so if there are any questions from the <laughs> Did I understand right when I heard that someone tried to solder an antenna on an XB? That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that turn out? Not as what I <laughs> what? Who, Whose idea was that? It was mine. <laughs> okay. To be honest though, uh, I got some assistance from a previous detail team, a EE detail team, who instructed me that I could in fact, soldered onto the XB, the antennas. And what did we learn from that? Doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> or that you have to do it very carefully and get the solder separate from the conductors because the antenna is, has, is comprised of two conductors that you need to maintain a distance in between them in order to get the signal to propagate to the antenna, okay. which I found out. So. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah. Great presentation. Uh, very impressive with the budget you had. Uh, who did those aluminum welds? That would be Serafino. Oh, well, we were nice. 
Uh, what did you learn about quad bike? I actually took. Um, I actually went to a community college for a couple years, and they had metal fabrication classes there. Part of that was learning how to take all the wood. Impressive. Nice job, guys. Hey, anything else from the floor? Yes. Uh, so why did you guys use a three cell lipo or a two cell instead of a three cell? Originally, we planned to use a four cell with the myon, uh, just because we need that voltage of 14 or 15 volts so we can drop it down. However, in um, considering redundancy of the power system, we need to cut down on mass. Four cell is usually 200 grams or bigger, so we went with the smaller two cell because we could get them at 50 or 60 grams a piece and put two of them in series and it worked out well. It's basically the same thing in a lower mass. And from there, we were able to achieve our redundancy. We just never implemented it. Okay, your valve subassembly, ACS thruster, main thruster, field tank, diffuser, are those on level three or are those actually three different levels? Because the way you have it uh, assembled there, it looks like it could be interpreted as many ways. So. Okay, so under the propulsion uh, main subassembly, there's the uh, the fuel tank, SES thruster, valve, main thruster, and diffuser within the propulsion, so it's, it, it is on the third level. The bottom level. Which one? All of them. All of them? All of them, yes. Okay, so you could have just spread them out from level three. Because right there you're saying you have five levels, but. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Good job, guys. Okay, we'll take a, a little break and let the other team set up and we'll, we'll start again at 11.30.